subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so that you do not miss any video lesson from Rao's IS. Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading. Today we are going to analyze the Hindu dated 20th of May 2020. Displayed on the screen is a list of topics that we are going to discuss today. Time stamping for the same has been provided in the description of the video. Let's begin our analysis. We are very proud to announce Rao's IS hybrid online program to prepare for Civil Service Examination 2021. The program is designed in such a manner that it will ensure same quality content at your home as we deliver here at our campuses. It also gives you the flexibility to join our campuses as and when you are ready to join the physical class program at our learning centers. Our GSI hybrid course has been designed to provide 360 degree guidance. First, our teachers cover everything from basic to advanced and given the dynamic nature of the exam, we focus on both the static syllabus and the current affairs. Second, we focus a lot on discussions and doubt solving to be able to impart real understanding of issues important for exam and so we promote group discussions and make expert doubt solving available to you at all times. Third, testing is another key requirement to crack the exam. The course gives you ample practice through class test and UPSC level test series. Finally, just before the prelims and mains exam, we help you in revising everything important through our highly targeted revision modules. If you want more information, you can log on to our website and download the GSI hybrid brochure. The description of the video has the link for that as well. You can get in touch with us using your preferred way. All the necessary details are given in the brochure, so please refer to that. From the entire team of Rao's IES, we wish you all the very best and we will be happier to partner with you in your journey of success. Page number 14 of today's newspaper highlights a very important news item which talks about behind new incidents a change dynamics along India-China border. The news basically highlights the kind of skirmishes or standoffs that we have seen recently. You must be aware of the fact that in the last few weeks, Indian and Chinese troops have been involved in as many as four incidents along the undefined line of actual control. The entire problem reached to the flashpoints in Galwan Valley, which is part of Aksai Chin, and in Demchok in Ladakh as well. Now, in this context, it is important for us to understand why India and China have not been in a position to solve their border disputes. Now, in this context, there are a few important pieces that we need to understand. First, China shares a border with more countries than any other state. Now, when China is sharing border with so many states, like 20 states, it has settled border disputes with many of them, which includes Myanmar, Nepal, North Korea, Mongolia, Pakistan, Laos, etc. Even with some of the former enemy countries like Russia and Vietnam, China has been in a position to settle its border disputes. Now, in this context, we need to understand what is the problem that basically stops India and China to find solution for their border disputes. In this context, we would like to go back in history and try to understand the causes of border disputes between India and China. Now, here we can also see that when you talk about India-China border disputes, they are basically divided into three sectors. First is Aksai Chin area. This is the western sector. Second, the middle sector, if you talk about, is about Sikkim and Bhutan. And third is the Arunachal Pradesh sector, which is also called as MacMahon line. Now, these three sectors are important in terms of the current problems that India and China are having. Apart from that, there were some problems in the middle sector of Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand as well. Now, as far as these issues are concerned, these are considered to be more or less settled. Now, in this context, let's first try to understand the genesis of Indo-China border disputes. Now, let us try to understand the major causes of problems in terms of Indo-China border. Now, in this context, the simplest cause of problem between Indo-China borders is the difficult terrain and nascent survey technology. Now, when we talk about the border disputes between China and India, we can imagine that boundaries were primarily laid out in the 18th and the 19th century. At the same time, this particular region of India and China is also home to Himalayan region. And hence, this is a very difficult terrain to conduct any kind of survey. Now, when these borders were being settled in 18th, 19th and 20th century, 
the survey technology that was available was of very nascent type, which could not take up the kind of challenge this difficult terrain of Himalaya has posed. So in this context, we know that there was very little help from survey technology, the terrain was difficult and hence a lot of area was not properly defined in terms of India and China border disputes. Second problem that has emerged is because of the absence of functioning Tibetan state. Now in this context, it is important for you to know that in 1914 at the Anglo-Tibetan Shimla conference, the British colonial authorities draw the MacMahon line. This particular line established boundary between British India and Tibet. Now it is important for you to know that the Chinese representatives were present at Shimla conference. However, they refused to sign or recognize the accords on the basis that Tibet was under the Chinese jurisdiction and therefore Tibet could not enter into any kind of treaties. So this becomes another important aspect because we are aware of the fact that Tibet is now part of China. Third important aspect which has caused a lot of problems is the craft of British imperial map making and the kind of changes that they have adopted. Now when we talk about the kind of map making that British people have adopted, especially in defining the border of India, there was a lot of ambiguity as well. Apart from that, there were some problems as well, especially when we talk about the Aksai Chin region. Now this region was defined by British at one point of time as part of state of Jammu and Kashmir. And when they were looking for any kind of invasion from Russian Empire, they defined this particular region to be part of Xinjiang. You can see here, this is the part of Xinjiang. So British policy in terms of defining the map of India was not very consistent. At one point of time, they defined a particular region and part of Jammu and Kashmir. At the same time, when it suited their interests in order to protect their interests in India, they defined a particular area as part of the Chinese area. And this is the kind of problem that British have given to India as well. Now, the most important aspect in this entire journey is the post-independence development. Now, we are aware of the fact that when we talk about India, India became independent in 1947 and China also started its journey of independence almost at a similar time in 1949. Now, as soon as China became independent, it basically invaded Tibet and in 1950, China declared Tibet to be part of China. Now in the early part, that is between 1950 to 1954, India asked China to maintain the independence of Tibet. However, the situation changed drastically in 1954 when India-China agreement on trade and intercourse between Tibet region of China and India was signed. As evident from the name, India accepted Tibet region as part of China in 1954 and in turn expected that China will stop claiming Arunachal Pradesh as part of its territory. This particular agreement of 1954 was signed by Indian Prime Minister Mr. Jawaharlal Nehru and Chinese Premier Zhao Enlai. Nehru imagined there was a trade-off between Tibet and the border. But at the same time, from the Chinese perspective, there was no trade-off real or imagined. And the Chinese position has steadfastly remained that India's recognition of China's sovereignty over Tibet and China's acceptance of former colonial MacMahon line was not a connected issue. So we can see here how this entire problem became much bigger in scope. India accepted Tibet to be part of China in 1954. In turn, what we wanted was that MacMahon line was considered as boundary between India and China and Arunachal Pradesh is accepted as part of India. At the same time, China was not willing to accept this particular situation and continue to raise claim over Arunachal Pradesh. The situation was further worsened in 1959 when Dalai Lama took refuge in India and he was declared the government in exile for Tibet. So in this fashion, the issue of Tibet was never settled between India and China. India has given acceptance to Dalai Lama government in Tibet and this government is operating from Dharamshala in India. This particular situation was never accepted by China and hence situation between India and China became worse off over a period of time. This resulted into war between India and China of 1962. Now both the countries India and China are at loggerheads and China claims that MacMahon line effectively sees India occupying some 90,000 square kilometers 
At the same time, India's claim is that China is occupying around 38,000 square kilometers of Aksai chain. Apart from that, a smaller area of 5,180 square kilometers was given by Pakistan to China in 1963. So we can see that in this particular fashion, there is an unsettled dispute between India and China. Now let us focus our attention on India, China and Bhutan border dispute. Now when we talk about Sino-Bhutan border dispute, in comprehensive power terms, the tiny Himalayan kingdom of Bhutan can be described almost as a non-entity to China. However, by virtue of three key features of its geography, Bhutan is of vital strategic importance to both India as well as China. So let's try to understand what are these key features. First and foremost, Bhutan is a landlocked country. It simply means that Bhutan has no access to either sea or another third country without passing through either Chinese or Indian land or space. In this sense, we can see that the ability of Bhutan to negotiate against its bigger neighbors is very limited. Second, Bhutan controls a number of Himalayan passes that serve as overland routes for the two great powers, that is India and China. It is also very important to understand that the kind of terrain we are talking about is very tough in nature. In such a terrain where it is very difficult for people or goods to move, such passes give an advantage to anyone who holds power on them. And third is, Bhutan is a strategic buffer for Siliguri Corridor. Now here you can see that this is what the Bhutan is. We can see Nepal, we can see Sikkim. And this narrow corridor between Nepal, Bhutan and Bangladesh is called as Siliguri Corridor. And it is also called as Chicken Neck. It is a narrow track of land which is between 20 to 60 kilometers wide that connect India's northeastern states with the rest of country. And this is of a strategic importance for India. Anyone who controls Siliguri Corridor can actually control India's access to northeastern India. Now in such a situation, the reason for the stalemate between India, Bhutan and China is essentially a strategic implication for India and Bhutan for accepting China's package deal settlement, which consists of territorial exchange rather than traditional sectoral approach of border resolution. In this context, let's focus on another image. As highlighted in this diagram, you can see here, this is where the Doklam Plateau is in which China is taking claim. Apart from that, this is Zakarlung and Samlung, which actually covers an area of 495 square kilometers. So what China is basically trying to do, it is trying to offer a kind of exchange. So exchange would involve China trading 495 square kilometers territory in central Bhutan, which is highlighted in these two areas. You can see that. And in return, it would expect 249 square kilometers territory in the northwestern Bhutan. We can see here, this is where the Doklam province is all about. Now for India, the deal would bring the China within the 500 kilometers of its Suligari corridor. So we can see here, if China is positioned here, the Siliguri Corridor, which is this region, this becomes very tricky situation to handle. It will offer China a commanding view of Indian border defenses and provide a launch pad to progress operation into Siliguri Corridor. As a result, there are fears that underlying motive of China's quest to resolve the border dispute seem not to be on the basis of traditional usage of history owing to strategic nature of western border. So in this way, we can see that this kind of a negotiation between Bhutan and China can be antagonistic to the interest of India and hence India is trying to defend the position of Doklam as much as possible. Page number 11 of today's newspaper talks about a very important topic from the perspective of environment, ecology and biodiversity and that is hotter oceans spawn super cyclones. Now this topic basically highlights that the record temperature in the Bay of Bengal have set the stage for storm systems. In this context, we are aware of the fact that Amphan has developed into a super cyclone and is expected to make a landfall today along the coast of West Bengal and Bangladesh. Now in this context, we have discussed about the naming of cyclone in yesterday's discussion by Mr. Weber Mishra. In case you have missed it, so please go back and watch that session. In this discussion, we are going to focus upon what could be the possible reasons behind increasing frequency of cyclones 
in the Indian Ocean. Now in this context we have taken the image which was given by Indian Meteorological Department and it talks about the kind of landfall that we are going to see. Now here in the green zone you can see here the green zone which is now being highlighted in terms of the blue outline. This is the region where the movement of the cyclone is expected. So somewhere in the coast of West Bengal or Bangladesh the impact would be much higher. IMD in its notification has clarified that it is very likely to move in the north northeastward across northwest Bay of Bengal and cross West Bengal, Bangladesh coast between Diga that is in West Bengal and Hatia island that is Bangladesh close to Sundarban during the afternoon to evening hours of today that is 20th of May. So this is what the projection is and we can see here this is what the trajectory is expected to be in terms of the cyclone Amphal. Now this brings us to the very important question that the article has highlighted and that is is it really true that frequency of cyclones is increasing? The answer is yes. And for explaining this particular issue, we have highlighted the occurrence of cyclone in terms of month wise. So you can see January, February and so on till you reach November and December. You can see here in the last three months, there have been many cyclones. Now when you talk about cyclones, cyclones are also important in terms of their intensity. So we can see that there is a super cyclone storm as well. So Kair is super cyclone storm. Again, focus on the severe cyclone storm, very severe and extremely severe cyclones in which their speeds are also defined. So you can see here how much catastrophic that these can be. Now if we focus on this table, we can see that there is three very severe cyclonic storms. There are two extremely severe cyclone storm and one super cyclone last year. So this shows the kind of occurrence or frequency of these cyclones. This year, just before the beginning of monsoon, we have seen super cyclone, which has shown highest intensity in last 20 years. So it clearly implies that the intensity or the frequency of cyclones have been increasing in the recent past. Now we need to understand what is causing the increased frequency of tropical cyclones. Now when we talk about tropical cyclones or cyclones per se, in this case, cyclones are caused by atmospheric disturbance around a low pressure area distinguished by swift and often destructive air circulation. Apart from that, cyclones are usually accompanied by violent storm and bad weather. And this is how they become very destructive in nature. And that is what the fear is. Now, India as a country is suffering from COVID-19 pandemic. And in these regions where the super cyclone is expected to cause a landfall, will find it difficult to make rescue and rehabilitation work easy. Now, in this context, we need to understand what are the conditions that leads to the formation of cyclones. Now, whenever you talk about cyclones, there are six main requirements. First, sufficiently warm sea surface temperature. Second important aspect is atmospheric instability. Third is high humidity in the lower and middle levels of troposphere. Fourth is enough coralist force to sustain a low pressure center. Next is a pre-existing low level focus or disturbance. And last but not the least, low vertical wind shear. So these are the six main requirements for the formation of tropical cyclones. Now in this context, when we are talking about this particular article, we will be focusing on heating of the Bay of Bengal. So in this context, first point is very important. That is sufficiently warm sea surface temperature. So now we can see that the temperature plays a very big role in all the process. Now let us try to understand what is happening in the Bay of Bengal. Now when we talk about the Bay of Bengal, we can see here in the graph in terms of the difference in temperature that we have seen in the last five decades. So from 1961 to 76, we can see hardly any kind of red spots here in Bay of Bengal or even in the Arabian Sea. However, when you talk about 1997 to 2005, the red zones have increased in frequency as well as in area. And it shows that the temperature has gone from around 27 and a half degree to around 30 degree in this particular region. It means that the temperature has gone up. And we are aware of the fact that cyclones gain their energy from the heat and the moisture generated by the warm ocean surface. So we can highlight that when we talk about ocean surface temperature here in 1961-76, this is in the range of 27.5 to 28 degrees Celsius. At the same time, when we go for a similar kind of comparison in 2005, the temperature has gone up to 30 degrees Celsius. And, it, and this is enough amount of energy to cause cyclones. Apart from causing cyclone, it can also lead to super cyclones. 
So we can see here the color towards the red denotes a temperature reaching 30 degree and you can see the increasing dominance of red color in the Bay of Bengal in the last five decades. Now higher than normal temperature in Bay of Bengal may be wetting super cyclones and the lockdown indirectly may have played a role. Now let's try to understand how lockdown might have contributed to these super cyclones. Now when you talk about reduced particulate matter emission during the lockdown meant fewer aerosols such as black carbon that are known to reflect sunlight and heat away from the surface. So when there was no lockdown, there was ample amount of aerosols. And this aerosol was doing what? This was causing albedo effect. Now when we talk about albedo effect, it means the sun's insulation is reflected back even before being absorbed by the surface. Now in the current situation, when there is reduced particulate matter, it means albedo effect is functioning less and hence more heat from the sun is being absorbed by the surface and is converted into radiation which is basically absorbed by the atmosphere and it basically heats the upper surface of the atmosphere as well as of ocean and this is what the problem is which we can see here. Apart from that, every year increased particulate pollution from the indo gadgetic plane is transported towards the Bay of Bengal and this also influences the formation of clouds over ocean. You must be aware of the fact that whenever we want to make clouds, we need to have aerosol particles which basically act as hygroscopic particles. Means these are the particles around which the water moisture basically accumulates and this basically causes a lot of rain to fall. But right now this is not is happening and this is causing cyclones to have higher intensity as well as more frequency and that is what the article basically wants to highlight. Page number 7 of today's newspaper presents an article which talks about a callous response. The author highlights that migrant workers who act as the backbone of an economy have been left in lurch since the lockdown began. Now this article basically highlights the kind of apathy that has been shown against the people who work in the informal sector. Now in this case the author highlights that both central and state governments are at fault. We are aware of the fact that because of novel coronavirus crisis, the migrant workers who lost their jobs are traveling back home on foot. Now the point that author wants to highlight is to understand that why state governments or the central government could not plan their efforts in order to bring these migrant people to their homes. Now in this context, it is important for us to understand that the first lockdown that was announced in the month of March, this was a step in the right direction because country was not ready to handle such kind of a coronavirus epidemic. So it gave the government time to mobilize its resources in order to fight this problem. At the same time, it is also evident that government didn't plan or take into account the possible plight that may befall on these migrant workers. Now in this context, let's try to understand what has happened. When the first lockdown was announced, for 21 days, the entire country was in a state of lockdown. Now when we talk about these people who are working in unorganized sectors, these are migrant workers, they have a small or meager savings and they have to actually fulfill few basic expenses. First of course is the housing. Second is of course food and third is of course medical and health. Now in the first stage when the lockdown was imposed and the country was under the lockdown for 21 days, whatever meager savings that they had in terms of meat, these three basic requirements that is housing, food, medical and health were exhausted. And when the lockdown was extended, they had no means available in order to travel back to their homes. Now the problem is the kind of transport facilities that are required in terms of railways, buses were not made available to them. So these people basically became victim of lack of planning from the government side. So when we talk about this particular lockdown, the people were staying at home, but the landlords were asking them to either pay rent or to vacate house. Second important, whatever meager income they had or savings they had, they've already exhausted it and the government could not ensure that the food reaches to every person. Third important aspect is medical and health. And when we talk about these people who are migrant workers or working in the small sectors, these people have problem in terms of expenses in the terms of medical health as well because they are not properly nourished. They do not have good immune systems as well and hence their problem was multiplied many times over. And this is what the author has defined as well. 
the epidemic has resulted in the loss of the jobs and hence no source of livelihood. And when they stayed for the extended duration, they have exhausted their income. So those people who were living in mega urban cities like Mumbai and Delhi were at a greater loss. Second problem that we can identify is that once these migrant workers and laborers who do not have any source of income for their sustenance are traveling back to their home, they do not have enough resources available for them in order to sustain themselves once they reach home. So the author highlights that this is the callousness of the government that has revealed their inability or lack of it to cope with the immediate needs of this migrant population traveling back home as they neither have financial or logistic support from the government in the time of such crisis. Now in this context, please try to understand, author not only blames the central and the state governments, but also on the social fabric of the country. In this sense, the author highlights that initial lockdown has definitely decreased the impact of disaster, which could have been much worse in a populous country like ours, that is India. However, social apathy still continues for the workers and laborers. Now, in this context, the author has highlighted that despite fiscal relief provided by the central government, many state governments like Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, Gujarat, Punjab, have passed labor laws which are against the interest of these workers. At the same time, the author highlights that there has been no collective protest or response to the society at large in terms of these kind of steps and initiatives which are taken by the central government as well as the state governments. So the author highlights that the social apathy that we have seen in terms of we have used these resources or the workers only for the sake of production. When we talk about agriculture, we require these migrant laborers in order to bring the crop from the fields to the home and ultimately to the cold storage. Later on, we require these migrant workers to take this crop from the storehouse to the market. Now, when we talk about MSMEs, we want these workers to perform their tasks to the full and ultimately go unpaid for the overtime work that they are doing. At the same time, these workers are not treated as if they are humans. They are treated as if they are machines and we can utilize them over and over again for an extended period duration so that they yield maximum benefit for the economy. This was further showcased in terms of tussle between the center and the state governments in terms of who will pay for the train fare for the people who are migrating back from the cities they work to the places they live. So we have seen the kind of problems these workers have faced in the recent past. Now there is one more problem that is important here to highlight. Now when these workers are traveling from the urban centers to the centers where they live, they do not live in big cities or centers. The trains or buses basically travel from big urban centers like Mumbai or Delhi to the places of like capitals or even big cities. But what is the provision for the last mile connectivity for these people? And this was not given a proper thought. And that is what the author highlights in terms of lack of apathy in terms of society and also from the perspective of the government. Next important point that the author highlights is that law not enough to protect migrants. So we know that there are some laws which are supposed to protect the interests or the rights of these workers. But laws such as Interstate Migrant Workmen Regulation in Employment Condition of Service Act 1979 and the Unorganized Workers Social Security Act of 2008 have been proved to be just an eye wash as they hardly offer any protection to the dislocated workforce on the ground. The first act that is the Migrant Workmen Law of 1979 regulates the employment of interstate migrant workmen and provides for their conditions of service. The second act that is 2008 law provides for social security and welfare for the unorganized workers. It constitutes national and state social security board which shall recommend to central and respective state governments suitable schemes for different sections of unorganized workers. Now here we can see some of the problems that author highlights in this particular case. Now when we talk about the first particular act, it basically talks about the condition of services. At the same time, we have highlighted that many states, Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, Gujarat, Punjab, have relaxed these laws against the interest of workers. So we can see that even this particular law has not served its purpose. Second important aspect is when we talk about the 2008 law, which talks about Social Security Act, 
we can see that through this act national and state security boards shall recommend so these are more of a recommendatory bodies and ultimately it is a responsibility of the government to convert these recommendations into something which is concrete now here the point that author wants to highlight that this is eyewash for the simple reason the kind of problem that we have seen it requires immediate relief and when we talk about these particular laws whether we talk about interstate migrant workers or even the 2008 law they are not providing immediate relief to these people and hence they are not protecting their interests now this brings us to the last part of discussion that is the way forward now these migrants have faced and will continue to face apathy from the central and the state governments the immediate problem is about their food security and the logistics for them in order to travel to their native places now the point that we need to understand is that right now they do not have any kind of money or other support in order to sustain themselves once they reach home second important aspect is that these workers are the backbone of the economy and must be treated like humans with compassion and not contempt you cannot consider them as machines who will continue to work regardless of the kind of condition we put them into third is in the longer run say 3 months after if these workers do not return to their work then it will create another set of challenge for the state as well as central government which they must understand and be prepared of now the author highlights that the kind of problem that we have seen for the migrant workers the government has not readied itself in terms of the kind of impact these workers have faced moreover in the time to come if they do not return back to the work what kind of impact this will have on economy last but not the least the author highlights that these migrant workers consist of 10% of india's gdp and hence cannot be taken for granted especially in times of rebuilding our economy after the epidemic so when we talk about this particular article the author basically cautions central government the state governments and the people at large that we should not treat these people as machines only we should treat them with compassion with humanity at the same time we should ensure that they can survive with dignity on the last page of today's newspaper there is a news about olive ridley turtles now when we talk about olive ridley turtles these have been discussed many times over in the past few months now you can actually refer to an article which was covered by mahak ma'am on 24th of february 2020 here she has discussed in detail about where these olive ridley turtles are found what is their iucn status what is the protection status that is guaranteed under wildlife protection act of 1972 and what are the important nesting sites so in this sense you are expected to go back and revise this news from the dns of 24th of feb 2020 now with this let's focus on the prelims practice now in terms of the news that we have discussed the first news that we have discussed is all about india china border in this case we have discussed upon important things like excise chain we have discussed about various kind of lines like macdonald line now from the prospective examination you should know more about these like like macdonald line macmohan line redcliff line and you should also know about johnson line which is important from the perspective of india china border dispute second topic that we have discussed is hotter ocean spawn super cyclone now super cyclones or cyclones are very important in this perspective they are important not only from the perspective of environment but also from the perspective of geography here you need to know what are the main causes of super cyclones you should also focus upon the kind of categorization and what are the features in terms of wind speed that is related to that third important aspect is the callus response this was more of a mains oriented topic and we need to focus on the kind of social security system that we have for our laborers and migrant workers the last important point is about olive ridley this again is very important from prelims and you should focus on where the olive ridley turtles are found you should also know about famous nesting sites and apart from that their iucn status as well if we cover all these important points it means that we have covered today's newspaper in terms of prelims practice as well with this we have come to the question of the day the question of the day reads consider the following statements about olive ridley turtles statement number 1 sex of the offspring of olive ridley turtles is also determined by the temperature at the nesting site second statement according to iucn the olive ridley turtle are classified under 
critically endangered. We have to identify the correct statements. Options are option A is 1 only, option B is 2 only, option C is both 1 and 2 and option D neither 1 nor 2.